Hey there, and welcome to the latest edition of your favorite Mets stories told by your favorite Mets. I'm Mike Janella, your host, but joining me today is a guy who was a huge part of the Mets rotation last decade, made 153 appearances for the Mets, including four straight seasons of 30 starts or more. Now you can just call him coach, back at his alma mater, Mike Pelfrey. How are you? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm not doing too bad. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. I see you've got the, you got the Shockers hat on, Wichita State, you're back, where it all started for you. We'll talk Mets in a little bit, but what's coaching life for you like? How's that been in your, uh, in your retirement life now? Well, it's been pretty, uh, been pretty awesome. And, you know, I, I always, you know, as my career got, went on, you know, in the big leagues, I, I kind of started getting the idea that that's kind of what I wanted to do after. You know, obviously I, I love baseball. And, you know, coaching, you know, was kind of the thing that would allow me to maybe continue to stay around baseball and kind of pass along some of the knowledge that I learned around the way and help these guys. And, you know, in all reality, too, there was only one place I wanted to do it, you know, if I was going to do it at the college level, and that was Wichita State. And right when I finished playing, uh, went back to school and uh, finished up my degree, uh, started to help volunteer to the D2, and then I uh, got the opportunity to go back to Wichita State, which, like I said, that's the place that I ultimately want to be. So uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty rewarding, too, when, when a guy kind of – when it clicks for a guy or a guy understands something you're trying to teach him. And uh, uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. And, and you know, the, the head coach is Eric Wedge, who's a former, uh, you know, big league manager. So it's a, it's a pretty cool little dynamic, which he was also a Wichita State Shocker as well. Yeah, I remember reading a story when I was doing research for this back in your playing days in like 2013 or something. You already said, I want to coach after I'm done, but only college. You didn't want to coach in the bigs or in the minors. What is it about the college level? Obviously, back at your alma mater must be great, but what was it that made you want to coach kids that age? Well, you know, I, I, you know, pro ball has an appeal to it, but, you know, for me, the, the bigger thing would be, in, be away from my family. Uh, you know, obviously, if if big leagues or any of that level, you're uh, you're gone for eight you're gone for eight months. You know, so obviously it's it can be hard. Uh, you know, being around. I have three little I have three kids. I have a 11 year old, nine year old, and a six year old. So, uh, you know, I'd love to most nights be able to go home and sleep in my own bed and be around them as much as possible. So, uh, college route college route to be able to do that college route was the way to go. Now, I want to talk about that because you mentioned three kids and they're all at ages where they need a lot of attention and they got a lot going on. So you retired 2018 and then you mentioned you volunteered at Newman University down at D2 uh, coaching for a little bit. You go back to get your degree, sports management at Wichita State. By the way, were you thinking you had some eligibility left to go pitch for the Shockers again or was that not even part of the equation? <laughs> no, that wasn't uh... – uh, I had a little, I had a little shoulder surgery at the very end, so I, I didn't. Uh, there was definitely no eligibility left. Fair enough, fair enough. The tank was empty for for the shocker career, but yeah, you go back, you get your degree, you're coaching, you've got the three kids, you're a husband, obviously, everything going on in your life. I mean, for people, I think nowadays they can really resonate with that. A lot of people working from home, trying to help raise the kids. There are a lot of things going on. How did you juggle all of that? What was your life like for that year, two years? You were figuring out your next chapter. And any advice you have for the rest of us that are trying to do a million things in life at the same time? Well, I, you know, obviously the school was probably tough, um, you know, but, you know, during the day, uh, you know, my wife didn't really give me much choice. This is kind of a, a story. So after this 2017 series, I was, I was literally home for about 10 or 11 days at the end of the year. And she came to me and was like, you're going to get a job, right? I think so. So, 10 days in I'm like I looked at her, I'm like babe I'm I just got done with the season you know with the and I finished with the White Sox 17 but I was literally home for 11 days she asked me if I was gonna get a job and hey, look, let me relax for a little bit let me chill. That's, that's what I said but you know I I at the time like I had already enrolled in school already started doing that the second eight week classes uh enrolling those so so but you know, like I told you I I was doing that to to go on and coach because I wanted to do that so I went and volunteered uh, you know, I called a buddy at the head up that coached at, you know, Kansas at, New at Newman and Wichita and uh, started to do that. But time management is obviously tough, you know, and I was able to do the schoolwork mostly, you know, during the day when my kids were at school. Um, and then when they came home, it was it was father, it was father time that time to catch up on that end. Which I'm sure they love. I'm sure you love. I'm sure your wife loves. It ends up being kind of a, a win win for everybody. All right. 
let's go to your big league career now. Let's take you back to when you were coming out of Wichita State the first time. You're a first-round draft pick of the Mets, number nine overall, 2005 draft. That's a pretty big deal uh, to be drafted that high. Take us back to those days. What do you remember? Because I mean, you've got Scott Boris as an agent, which draws a lot of attention. You're a top 10 pick, which is a lot on you. What was the hype like, the attention? How did you deal with all that? What do you remember from, from that time in your life now that you have some perspective looking back on it all these years later? Well, just I think pretty, you know, overall pretty blessed, you know, for the opportunity and, you know, blessed to be able to do it in a, uh, a huge market, you know, like New York. I remember, uh, you know, coming to uh, New York and getting the opportunity to, uh, you know, do my physical and go through all that there and getting put up in a hotel in, in downtown New York City. And, you know, I remember opening the mini bar and seeing like Voss water. And I'm like, holy shoot, this is pretty cool. <laughs> a little glass, glass bottle. And I'm, and this isn't kinda, tap, baby. Yeah, we got the we got the Voss for the boss. Yeah. So, so that, that kind of right there, a kid from Kansas who didn't, you know, didn't grow up with a lot of money or anything like that. And looking at that and, and being like shocked. And I remember calling buddies and open up the, the, the mini fridge in the hotel and stuff like that. And, uh, and then, you know, obviously getting the opportunity to, you know, eventually, you know, get to play in New York and, um, you know, be around that and my family come in and we're driving around to find a place to eat the night, the night before I make a hotel or before I make my debut. And it's like, it's like twenty five dollars to park or something, and I'm like, "Well, the heck with that." And I end up we end up driving back to Queens and parking at the hotel, and then trying to find we find somewhere around there. So, uh, total, it's a total culture shock, I think, coming from Kansas, but uh, ended up being pretty special. As someone coming from that background, Kansas, and you mentioned not a lot of money, you get that big first round signing bonus. I always love asking high draft picks this. What was the first thing that you bought? What was your first splurge once you had a little bit of a cash in your pocket? Well, I bought a I bought a Yukon, um, a, a, a GMC Yukon, so um, an SUV, which is was actually my first my first car. So even though I went to Wichita State, you know, I lived really close to campus and I walked everywhere because we couldn't, you know, we couldn't afford a car at the time. So uh, I bought a car it was my first my first purchase. Hey, you know what? If you're going to do a $25 valet parking at a restaurant, you might as well pull up and file a brand new truck and be ready to go, right? <laughs> no, no, no doubt. It's probably, uh, <laughs> that was a pretty big shock at the time. 20, $25. But, uh, in some places, that, that's a deal nowadays when you look back on it in some places, let me tell you. But yeah, sticker shock, I'm sure, coming from, man, culture shock too. So then that first season, I mean, you shot the moon. You start at high A, and then you pitch in double A that same season, triple A. You get a cup of coffee in the bigs. You get four starts with the Mets in the show, all in 2006. I mean, it's a big difference, you know, taking the bus to go pitch at, you know, Brevard County, taking on the Manatees, versus flying charter to Miami to pitch against the Marlins that same year. I mean, how did you handle all that, all those differences? That had to be a complete, you know, 180 and then a, a back again. And, I mean, how did you do it? That's a crazy year. Yeah, it was pretty quick. I ended up making four starts in, in uh, high A, then obviously getting called up to, you know, getting called at double A. And I remember the first start went well, and then, like, the next four or five didn't go well. Um, and for me, that was, pretty, that was pretty tough at the time because that was probably the first time in my life I really struggled. Uh, was double A in, the, in that five start period, you know, and I remember throwing against Akron and I threw four innings, got 14 hits in double A and I'm like, holy smokes and walking, but coming in the next day and the hitting coach actually asked me, couldn't believe I was there the next day. And I'm like, all right, this is, <laughs> he, he gets it too, I guess. So, uh, but obviously making through it and, you know, as a, you know, all athletes are, are competitive and, you know, obviously want to <clears throat> have a certain degree and want to get after it and compete and, uh, so I just kept working to try to get better and be able to do that and kept, you know, kept moving up the ladder there. Uh, and then obviously you get to the, you know, you get to the big leagues, which is what you've worked your whole life for and getting that opportunity. And, you know, that's a whole, obviously a whole nother, uh, whole nother level. And I always describe it as it's like, you know, you're looking through a magnifying glass as you're playing, you know, and, and everything kind of seems like it's larger in life, which is, uh, you know, obviously pretty special. You told us a story about the, the mini fridge and the nice hotel downtown when you come up to New York for the first time. Give us a clubhouse story. PG, PG-13, you could even get away with it a little bit. 
what was the first moment, maybe that behind the scenes story you can tell us when you realized, wow, I'm, I'm in the show, like I'm in the big, this is, this is it. Well, I, you know, I think, I think just walking through, I, mean, my, I always, I would tell people my very first day, which is, which is in spring training uh, in 2006, I walk in, the very first person I, I see is, is Tom Glavin, who, you know, me growing up, me growing up, I, I was a huge Atlanta Braves fan, uh, you know, more, more because they, they were on TV, you know, here in the Midwest and all over. And I saw them and I walked in and he's like, Hey, I'm a Tom, Tom Glavin. I looked and I'm just, and I'm like, <laughs> and I was like, look, like, I, I know who you are. Yeah. That's yeah. And I started like, starting like, <laughs> you know, I know who you are. Like, I grew up watching you and he looked at me and said, thanks for making me feel old kid. And he walked off and, and, I, <laughs> and I, no, 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 like, kind of like started stuttering like, uh, 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 hey, uh, 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 and, and he walked off and I went, oh my gosh, what just happened? I thought I just crushed this oh, guy. Obviously he was joking, uh, but obviously with the, you know, Billy Wagner and, and Pedro Martinez, it, it was, uh, that was kind of the first time that, you know, obviously it wasn't necessarily the big leagues because there was a lot more dudes around at spring training, but that was kind of my first time in the clubhouse thinking, Oh shoot! These guys, this is pretty cool. You ended up pitching with a lot of legends, both Mets and all times, and we're gonna come back to that later. That's called a tease, Mike, in this business. So start thinking of some good stories you have of pitching with guys like Pedro and Tommy and the rest of them. We'll come, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Then, you, so you start making your way, right? Oh six, you get the cup of coffee, the four starts. A uh, couple years later, finally, oh eight, I had to look to make sure I had the notes right here. You start coming into your own to the tune of. 10 straight starts without giving up a home run, which I think is still the Mets record. It was at the time, I'm pretty sure. And these weren't the starts like today where you're an opener, you go an inning and two thirds or two innings. You went 62 and two thirds innings over 10 starts without giving up a homer. That seems to me today, the way baseball is played, almost impossible. How'd you do it? What was your secret? Without huge strikeout numbers, how were you able to succeed when you were feeling it back then? Well, I think like you mentioned, that was the first time that I started to – um, you know, feel good and feel like I, I belonged, um, you know, in the big leagues. And, you know, my trade, my pitch was always my sinker. Uh, you know, obviously it's a little different now. And, you know, guys pitch up in the zone more because of the swing and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, I pitched the bottom of the zone as much as I could to allow my sinker to be the best I could and keep the ball on the ground, which, you know, obviously when you do that, you have a, uh, you know, chance to keep the ball in the park, you know, and, and, if the, I hope that is a still record. I mean, that's going to be that's hard to beat, especially with the balls now and stuff with the swings, like I talked about. But um, you know, pound the bottom of the zone. That just be the thing. And I know Rick Peterson at the time uh, used to always talk about it. At the, at the zone, it's called called it the 190 zone. You know, all across the zone at the bottom of the zone, guys hit 190. So I tried to live by that and pitch the bottom of the zone uh, as much as possible. Just to put that stat in perspective, that I told you about with the homerless streak. So Jacob DeGrom, who a lot of people, myself included, think is the best pitcher in the game today, in his first two Cy Young seasons, those are 162-game full seasons, his longest stretch was six starts without allowing a homer. You went 10. So to give people an idea how impressive that is, really impressive. So good job with that sinker, keeping that, that 190 zone popping. You move on, and then let's fast forward a little bit to uh, the next year at this point, I guess 2009. City Field opens. And you get the honor, the responsibility of being the first starting pitcher there for the Mets uh, at, at the new park. The game didn't obviously go the way that I'm sure you wanted it to or the way the Mets wanted it to. But results aside, in the end, what do you remember about that day and kind of being that bridge in Mets history? That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Pretty awesome to be able to obviously pitch the first game in, in, um, you know, in the new ballpark, which obviously, you know, they did an unbelievable job. Uh, that place is pretty special. It's pretty neat. Uh, obviously, one of the nicer ballparks in in in, in Major League Baseball. Uh, but I, I, the one thing I always take more than anyway, everybody, somebody wrote in the in the paper or something about no one's ever hit a home run in the first, you know, the first batter of the game in a, in an opening up a new stadium. And the players were joking around, doing this, and, and somehow <laughs> it started getting to my head, and I started thinking about it. And all I remember That's is bad the news. first batter of the game got hit a home run. And uh, I remember thinking, like, holy shoot, the power, you know, the power of the mind. When something gets in there and you think about something and it goes through there, and, you know, obviously it happened, which is something you didn't, obviously didn't expect. But I didn't expect at the time because it's never happened. But 
it's amazing that, that that was actually on my brain than it than it actually happened there. Yeah, it's the problem. You start thinking about it so much, it's almost like your body just subconsciously kind of makes it happen almost. That you made history at least. That's like one way to look at it. Silver lining now all these years later. I'm sure at the time you weren't excited about that. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't at time. That's on the wrong side of history, as I just said. Right, right. And hey, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, which one did you like, by the way? Because you pitched the Shea a good amount, and then you pitched the City for the bulk of, of the second half of your time with the Mets. Which one did you, did you like better? Well, you know, I think, I think um, you know, Shea has a special place in my heart, obviously, being, being the place that I got to make my debut and stuff like that. But, you know, for me, it was, it was pretty it – was, it, needed, it needed to change. It was a little – it was old at the time and run down. And uh, obviously, there was a lot of history and all that. And, uh, but obviously the newer ballpark, uh, you know, city field is pretty, it's pretty amazing. Like I said, they did a great job and the clubhouse and the amenities and stuff is, is off the charts. So I, I enjoy, I enjoyed, uh, city field better, but like I said, Shea has its place too. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, I've, I've been going to Mets games since I was, you know, four or five years old and city is a gem. It's immaculate, but there is that special something about Shea, right? If you ever had the chance to play there or watch a game there, Maybe not the, the most modern place compared to today, but it's always going to have a special place in the heart. And I'm, I'm, it makes me happy to hear you say something like that, too. So yeah. I'm glad that you had a, a good experience in both. Next year, then, 2010, you start clicking. So you're at City Field now all the time, but it's not there. It's home. It's on the road. You start the year 9-1. and one. I mean, you got it all going on. What, do you remember any games or any stretches or any particular memories where you were like, man, I'm finally – it's working. I got it going finally all together at once. Yeah. You know, early on, um, I threw, uh, I threw in Colorado and had a really good start and I think it was like seven scoreless. Um, and then I came back, uh, in so Colorado. Like, yeah. That's a good, that's a good sign. Yeah. And I felt, I was feeling good. And, uh, you know, I came in actually, I threw that was on a Thursday and I remember. And then on, on Saturday, actually that's that famous game where Johan Santana went, and game ended up going like 20 innings or 21 innings. And uh, I had thrown a bullpen earlier that day on Saturday, which is two days later, and I kept pitching, you know, seven hours or eight hours after my bullpen. I wanted to ask you about this. Yeah, but keep going. I got some other questions, but keep going. So, I, I, you know, and I was a guy that threw a lot, you know, threw a lot of pitches. So, I mean, I probably threw 70 pitches in my bullpen, 60 pitches in my bullpen. Uh, it obviously felt good. At the time, I was pretty ticked off because I, I had been walking around with a bat for 12 innings wanting to hit. <laughs> uh, and, you know, they wouldn't let me hit, which is for good reason. Uh, but, but doing that and pitching and then on normal rest, you know, my normal day pitching, I started against the Cubs and threw a, I think I went eight scoreless the next time or something like that. So that's the one part where I'm like, all right, man, I'm, I'm in a really good spot. You know, I'm in a good spot about, you know, mechanically, every, everything I feel, everything's working. Um, you know, and obviously at that time that, that kind of helped propel me right there, that confidence and about where I was at. All right, so I want to go back to that 20-inning game. It sounds like you remember it like it was yesterday, so I'm glad because I had this marked on my notes, like I want to talk about this. Your only career save, so congrats on notching that. But, yes, I got it here. April 17, 2010, Mets beat the Cardinals in St. Louis 2-1. to one. Six hours and 53 minutes the game. It wasn't even any scoring until I think the 19th inning is when all the runs, the 19th and 20th is when they, when they came about. What do you do – because you you pitch your bullpen, you've done your side session for the day. You don't expect to pitch at the beginning of the night or the day. What do you do as a starting pitcher for those seven hours until you know, hey, go to the pen, we need you? Are you like, how do you stay entertained? I I don't know how you spend that much time without an active involvement in the game. So what's the, what's that kind of the game like for you in those shoes? Well, it's 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 long, you know, obviously, and and I I kept my mind kind of into it just because I was I was ready to hit like. They literally called. Right, so the hitting other, was the thing. Yeah, I wanted to hit. You know, they called on every other starting pitcher to hit, and you know, we got to a point. You know, we brought K, K Rod in uh, to save the game and did not save the game. Uh, you know, we get they scored. We back, came back and you know we get we scored. Then they came back and scored. Uh, and I remember thinking like, well, dang, if I'm not going to hit, we don't have any guys left. I'll go throw. And uh, you know, I thought in all reality, I thought it was probably a it was a better, probably a better idea than it actually was because I remember going to the pen and, and started playing catch. I'm like, oh, shoot. 
I felt better like seven hours ago when I threw my bullpen. <laughs> well, now. yeah, you just threw 70 pitches seven hours ago. The arm's going to be a little bit sore, I think. Yeah, and I worked out and ran and did all that. So I didn't, I didn't really feel that good. Uh, then I end up getting called in the game, and I'm and I remember I'm just like I'm just trying to throw strikes and see what happens here. And to be on to to be honest, and you know, luckily I I was able to get three outs before giving up a run, and and uh, everybody got to go home, which is which is a plus. Yeah, at that point, I'm sure you part of your mind was just like, you know what, let's get this thing over with and get the W head home. Did you like hitting? You mentioned you wanted to hit all that game in your career. Did you look forward to it? I I I love to hit. I mean, I I was. Wasn't very good. You know, I, it wasn't very good to be honest, but it's kind of a different perspective as a, as a pitcher. And on top of it, you know, there's there's zero pressure. So if you get a hit, you, it's it's unbelievable. If you get out, hey, you're supposed to get out. So uh, I I just enjoyed you know the different perspective, and I enjoyed going out there and and, and trying to compete. And you know, I wasn't obviously a big league hitter, you know, by any means. So I wasn't very good, but. You know, it's just – it's a different – getting there in the box and it shows you how hard it is to hit, you know, and, and uh, when you face some of these guys. But just an opportunity to compete, you know, which is which is what – you know, I, I said everybody at that level kind of – you know, they kind of cherish that part of it. Hey, if I let not being good at something stop me from doing something, I wouldn't do much in this life. So, yeah, if you weren't great at hitting but you'd love to do it, like, you go for it. That's part of part of the fun of being in the big league. Um after the Mets, Mike, you, you end up, uh, you know, you pitch in Minnesota, you pitch in Chicago, you pitch in Detroit. Like you mentioned, home is, is Wichita, where you are back now, where you came from. But what is it about New York that you miss the most or that you miss during your playing days or now looking back on it with a little perspective? What is it about this place that, that sticks with you? You know, I think for me, I think the, it, it took a while maybe to adjust to New York, you know, just for the fact that, like I told you, I was a, I'm a Midwestern kid, you know, and it's slow paced. Uh, you know, there's not a whole lot necessarily going on, um, you know, and, and the city that never sleeps and the excitement, you know, the thing I miss more than anything is, you know, obviously you miss the guys and stuff like that. Uh, but, but the thing I miss more than anything is how much New York loves sports, you know, and the excitement and how much everybody pours into it. Now, believe me, if, if, if you're struggling, there's a, there's a, it's a downside because they let you know about it. But if you're, if you're right, doing right. well and the team's playing well, how much, how much they get into sports and how much they support, you know, their team. So uh, that's the one thing that I will always take away of, of, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's a greater sports town in, in, uh, you know, in, in the United States and the world, you know, than New York. And, you know, obviously, like I said, you know, the fans and the media and everything kind of play into that, but, you know, it also could be a negative, like I told you too, if, if you know things aren't going well. But uh, it's pretty cool seeing the seeing the support. Hey, it's got my vote for best sports town uh, in the world. Did you get caught up in any of the other sports, like in the off season, cheering for other basketball teams, football teams, anything like that in the area, or were you kind of just locked in on on Mets baseball? No, you know what? I, I've never, I've always been, I've never really been a, you know, like an NBA guy, or I've never been an NFL guy. You know, I did, you know, obviously. Eli Manning and stuff like that because they had some pretty successful teams in there and some and some uh, Super Bowl runs. So I did root for them. I did pay attention to them. But uh, you know, obviously the uh, you know the Mets were the, the main team that I ever rooted for. Hey, nothing wrong with that. All right, Mike, we're gonna let you go soon. But I always like ending these conversations with a, a quick little like bonus segment uh, here at the end. And with you. Talked about it earlier, you pitched alongside some of the greats, not just in Mets history, but baseball history. So I've got a couple guys here for you. I'm going to throw out a name, and you just give me the first, like, story or memory or bit of advice, just whatever comes to mind first about pitching alongside this guy, sharing a clubhouse with this guy. Sound good? Yep. Awesome. So the first one you mentioned, that you met him, your, your childhood idol, one of them, spring training, your first one in, in the bigs, Tom Gladman. Give me, give me some more goods with you and with you and Tom. Well, being being young, uh, I, re I remember throwing a bullpen early on. This is probably my first week in the in the big leagues, and you know I had a bullpen, and I threw my breaking ball, which I, you know I'll admit wasn't very good uh, at the time, but but I I threw it, and Rick Peterson ended up telling me at the time I threw a breaking ball. And he said, he told me this, and I'm 22 at this time, but he told me that, 
The next time you think about throwing that, he said, just call timeout, step off, and throw it in the gap. <laughs> and, <laughs> Might as well, right? <laughs> that's what he told me. So I, I was like, all right. So it kind of flustered me a little bit. And I finished my bullpen. And I went inside of the weight room. And the first guy I saw was Tom Glavin. And I started ranting to him, you know, like, what is this and that? And, you know, at the time, Peterson said I had another bullpen the next day. So Tom Glavin actually came out to the bullpen the next day and kind of helped and kind of maybe diffused the situation. Because I was frustrated because no one had ever kind of say that to me. But he did that. But, but Tom was, you know, as I told you, growing up rooting for him and watching him and being an idol, he was everything that you would expect. He was a true professional. He worked his butt off. He cared about his craft. Uh, just a true, I think, leader, uh, and and pretty amazing to be a, to be a true teammate. So uh, everything you could possibly say good about him is is uh, is true. That's great because they say never meet your heroes, right? You're just going to be disappointed, but it ends up sometimes that's not true. Like it was, yeah, he was, you, awesome. Uh, he was awesome. How about Pedro Martinez? Uh, he kind of took me under his wing too. You know, he was big. He was big into. Um, drinking water and staying hydrated and taking care of yourself. You know, he, he used to tell me at the end of the day, I better have 10 bottles of water by my desk or by my, by my, uh, by my um, locker at the end of the day. And I had to drink 10. He kind of, he kind of stayed on me, but uh, incredible, um, obviously incredible, incredibly talented, obviously a, a freak of nature. His fingers, his fingers were, I don't know, 10 inches long. It seemed like maybe it seemed like they were longer and, and, you know, the way he could manipulate a baseball and, you know, throw change ups and vary speeds on him, you know, 15 miles an hour uh, was obviously pretty good, but, uh, you know, pretty special to be around of. High energy, had a lot of fun, joked around a lot, big old kid, but uh, obviously really, 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 really talented. All right, the kids out there, you want to be like Pedro, you don't have the long fingers for that change up, at least drink 10 bottles of water a day and that'll get you somewhere along the line. Uh, how about Johan Santana? He was, you know, I always remember him. Um, he, I always remember him throwing in Atlanta and, you know, the score was like two to one or something in the eighth inning or something. And, um, Chipper Jones was hitting and there was a guy, there was two outs and a guy on second or a guy on first and he gave up a hit and the Braves took the lead, you know, so now it's three, two and they go out to take Johan out. And I remember him walking off the field and, and Chipper went from second to third base coach, talked to him and he walked by him and he, and he hit Chipper on the butt and told him good and told him good job. And I kind of looked at him like, man. And he said, Hey, mano to mano, you beat me. I gave you my best and you beat me. And that's kind of always the, the, the impression I always got of Johan that he, he was, he, he enjoyed to just go out there and compete. And obviously he was really, really good at, at what he did, but he was carefree. He was careless. He didn't care. Hey, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to give you everything I have. And if you beat me, so what? But I'm going to let you know something. You're going to have to beat me because I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it today. And, you know, game day at 6 o'clock and he had the, you know, the Latin music going blaring in the clubhouse. He was dancing. He was getting ready. And it was, it was, it was really in the clubhouse. It was kind of a – a uh, festival, a festival every every game day. You know, obviously everybody felt good about him going out there and pitching and our chance to win, but he but he brought that energy and I think people people fed off that, which is which is pretty cool. But the ultimate competitor, uh, great dude, got after it, great teammate, um, like pretty cool to be around. That's awesome. Last one for you. All, all I want to know about R. A. Dickey. Did you ever try and get him to teach you how to throw that knuckle or no? You know, I did, but I, I always had a problem with chewing my fingernails, so I could never dig in like him. But when he actually first came up and as we went through it, I was always his catch partner. Uh, and he used to wear me out. I mean, I used to get hit three or four times every day trying to catch that knuckleball because it was obviously pretty uh, pretty devastating and moved, and, and he threw it pretty harder than most people. But uh, I always out there digging in and ready to try to catch it. But obviously pretty cool what he was able to do and, and how he kind of just took off. And he obviously, he perfected that knuckleball and got pretty confident with it. And uh, it became really, really hard to hit. So uh, yeah. Yeah, pretty awesome for, for him. And obviously he was another, he was another guy that was, uh, you know, cared about him and, you know, had his ups and downs and was able to overcome it and be pretty, 
be pretty dang good at the end. I never thought about that. If you if you're a nail biter, then you can't really be a muscle baller. But I guess that's that's the reality of the situation, right? So thanks for for bringing that to my attention because I never thought about that. It's amazing. All right, Mike. Thank you so much for the time. Continue best of luck with the coaching career, Wichita State, with raising those three kids. And we really appreciate. It. Hope to see you back out here at uh, at City Field sometime down the road. I appreciate. It. Thank you for having me. Take care and stay safe. All right. For Mike Pelfrey, I'm Mike Janella. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.